Well, good evening all and welcome to the Wednesday evening webinar, uh, which has become part of our uh, uh, CME program um, over the year. And I'm delighted uh, this evening that we're going to have uh, the first of a series of uh, webinars um, on neurotrauma. And I'm very grateful to uh, Motion Javapur, who is well known to us and Motion very kindly uh, participated and uh, in a webinar uh, earlier this year and uh, has been very supportive of uh, um, bringing uh, neurosurgical uh, expertise uh, um, and uh, updates in management of head injuries uh, to um, the attention of all those involved in emergency medicine and general surgery and trauma and orthopedics who have to have on occasions uh, look after uh, patients with head trauma who are not actually uh, in a neurosurgical unit. So we're very grateful and I think it's a, it's a really important development. Um, Motion will do the introductions later, but I'm very pleased that Kieran Sweeney, who's a consultant neurosurgeon at Beaumont, and Michael Amu, who's a registrar in neurosurgery at Beaumont, are both going to give us presentations. Uh, I think they're case-based presentations, which will illustrate points that we can then uh, go on and discuss. A couple of housekeeping notes. Firstly, please turn off your video if you're not actually speaking. Um, the reason for that is it's distracting. Uh, to have uh, a lot of movement on the screen. And the second thing is kindly turn off your microphone uh, because uh, background noise can sometimes interfere uh, with uh, the speaker. The chat function should be used to send in any questions and Motion and myself will keep an eye to that. And if there are questions that can be put to Kieran or Michael uh, during the uh, presentation or a, a discussion at the end, uh, we'll do so. So my thanks to all and particularly also to the Vice President Laura Viani and uh, to uh, Catherine Jordan, who's the fellows and members um, uh, 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 manager uh, and to the backroom staff with uh, Porik Kelly and his uh, colleagues uh, for arranging everything. So over to motion, over to you motion and thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the RCSI for giving us this opportunity, particularly Professor O'Connell and Professor uh, Viani, and also to Padraig Kelly, who's helped us uh, get it this far. Could I have the slides on? Um, so uh, the reason I, I kind of we, we thought this would be uh, a good idea, I gave a talk about the management of head injury in non-neurosurgical hospitals about um, a little under 12 months ago. And it kind of became very clear that we as a department need more uh, interaction with others, uh, with, with other hospitals, with the uh, everybody who really manages trauma. And uh, because head injury is such a big part of trauma, all of you out there who are managing trauma will be encountering and managing patients with head injury. Um, and that's when we thought it would be a good idea to set these uh, webinars up. And as I'll go on, I'll explain to you that hopefully this will be one of the first uh, in, in a whole series of webinars. Uh, next slide, please. I just uh, before uh, we go to on to the case presentations, I just want to give a little bit of an overview of where head injury and traumatic brain injury sits amongst all other trauma uh, and then where does it sit in our work in neurosurgery amongst the rest of the work that we do. So to understand that I just thought some of the um, uh, some of the classifications for uh, injury severity are useful to know about. Um, you probably all know about uh, how injury severity is recorded and is based on what's called the abbreviated injury scale or the AIS. It was actually introduced by Association of Advancement of Automotive Medicine, which now is an international organization with over 20 countries participating. And they essentially take each of nine body regions, which you can see uh, on the bottom left of the slide, head, face, neck, thorax and so on. And they take each region and then they uh, they have a whole list of injuries, I think something like 2,000 
uh, or over and they will match the injuries to that and then they will classify for each body region is it uh, 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 minor moderate serious and uh, and so on uh, from gray from scale one up to six for each body region and six is incompatible with life and then from that you can calculate the injury severity score so you take a b and c which are the ais scores for the three most severely injured body regions uh, and then you square them and you add them up and you get your ISS and that can range from 3 to 75 and 3 up to uh, 8 is classified as minor injury, 9 up to 14 is classified as moderate injury and more than 15 is classified as severe injury. Now, some people use the word severe for ISS more than 15 and some people use major injury for ISIS more than 15 and that's really important to understand because for example in the major trauma audit report of Ireland uh, when it says major trauma audit when you actually are looking at the initial data they present that's actually all all severities of injuries and then they class the ISIS more than 15 are called severe in other reports if you read them internationally major injury means ISIS more than 15 so the terminology is important and the reason ISS more than 15 is important is that 75 percent of trauma deaths are, are in the sorry motion you've gone mute for some reason am I back yes okay could we uh, next slide please so uh, in in Ireland if you look at the national data um, if we look at all trauma, so you look at that bar chart on your left, um, blue is brains, uh, orange is spinal injury and so on. Chest, or, chest, chest and abdomen are together in the gray and then limbs are yellow. And essentially, if you look at all severities of trauma, the, the, the numbers are fairly well distributed or equally distributed between those regions. But if you look at the bar chart on the right, and you look at patients that have a, a severe injury, so the ISS more than 15, uh, almost 60% of them have traumatic pain injury. Next slide, please. Um, the, uh, this, uh, this then is looking at surgical intervention with patients with ISS more than 15. And in the whole group of ISS more than 15, if you look at the bar chart on the right, Brain and limbs have the highest number of operations uh, in ISS more than 15. And then if you look at the bar chart on the right, that patient, that's patients that had surgery within six hours of arrival to a hospital. Now that may be the primary hospital that receives them or the secondary hospital where after transfer. And the largest number of, of that group uh, tends to be traumatic brain injury. So the point of this is that all of you are actually dealing with patients with brain injury and we are a point of contact for you. Uh, could you go to next slide, please? Uh, then if you look at uh, trauma as part of a neurosurgical center's work, we, um, we overall for all emergencies, all types of uh, emergency on-call neurosurgical referrals, we receive 8,200 or thereabouts phone calls per year. So that, that phone that the um, our registrar carries uh, receives about 20 to 23 calls uh, per day, as in referrals, new referrals. And that's adults only, it doesn't include the pediatrics. Uh, the, the main categories are traumatic brain injury, spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage, like subarachnoid hemorrhage from aneurysms, or a, say a hypertensive intracerebral hemorrhage, brain tumors, we receive a lot of spinal calls as well, including cord equina syndrome, spinal tumors, and some spinal injuries, including fractures, hydrocephalus, and then infection. So of those 8,200 calls per year, about 1,500 uh, calls per year or referrals per year are traumatic brain injuries, which equates to about four calls per day. Next slide, please. And traumatic brain injury, as you know, can be divided into minor, moderate or severe based on the Glasgow Coma score, uh, as, as is shown here. And if the Glasgow Coma score is less, less than nine, we call that severe injury or coma. Next, next slide, please. And that's the sort of injury I suppose we tend to deal with. The, the scan on the top left is an extradural hematoma. 
bottom left is acute subdural hematoma, the top right is bifrontal contusions, and the bottom left, uh, bottom right is uh, diffuse injury, diffuse axonal injury and swelling. And the operation in the middle is a decompressive craniectomy, allowing a very swollen brain to expand out. Uh, next slide, please. So that kind of gives you a flavor of where, I suppose, a, a traumatic brain injury sits amongst other injuries and where does it sit in the middle of the rest of the work that we do in a neurosurgery department. Uh, we really want to collaborate and, and interact with uh, everybody that, that is dealing with trauma and the, the webinars that we are planning. At the moment, we have set a, a, a first Wednesday of each month at 8 a.m. Now, we're having some conversations among our, ourselves in that if it clashes with a, a lot of other meetings, we may change that time. But initially, we will start on the first Wednesday in December. They will tend to be case presentations to highlight the, the management of head injury. And we will provide you in due course with, a, with an email address where you can share your cases with us. And you may want to tell us how we did badly or how we did well or how the management of a case went and, and a discussion around those cases. Next slide, please. So um, that's my talk, and I, I'm delighted to uh, uh, let uh, introduce Kieran Sweeney, who's one of our colleagues who's been a consultant now for uh, about two, two or three years, Kieran, isn't it? And, and he's going to talk about uh, some aspects of neurotrauma. Thanks. Thank you, Mohsen. Um, Good evening, everybody. Um, as uh, Mohsen said, my name is Kieran Sweeney. I am a consultant in Beaumont Hospital and Temple Street Children's Hospital. Um, and, and this evening, I'll be presenting a case of a severe, severely head injured patient. And at, at each point, um, I'll, I'll briefly describe some of the principles behind um, the management of this patient. Um, next slide, please. So this was a 30-year-old um, gentleman who was crossing the road. He was struck at very high speed by a, a, a van. On the scene, he was um, reported to be um, unresponsive with possible abnormal um, posturing. Next slide, please. So on arrival with the paramedics, which is the first time point that we would ask about, um, he, he had um, ABC um, standard ATLS um, treatment, and there was no evidence of airway obstruction and C, um, a hard C-spine collar was placed. He was noted to have labored breathing and um, slightly tachypnic. He was on a 100% um, rebreather mask um, and saturations were 100%. He was car cardiovascularly stable. Um, however, his GCS was reported as three with unreactive in pupils. He was given one gram of transagamic acid um, on the scene. And a recent um, trial that came out, um, such as CRASH-3, has shown that this um, improves um, uh, mortality and morbidity in, in mild to moderate um, head injured patients, um, but uh, um, particularly when given within um, three hours. Next slide, please. So the second time point we, we tend to ask about is um, on arrival to the emergency department. He Again, he had um, full ATLS um, uh, Treatment, um, he had rapid sequence um, intubation by the anaesthetist. He was known to have good airway bilaterally. He was slightly, well, he was hypertensive, um, but in normal sinus rhythm. He, he remained GCS3. His pupils reported as small um, and slugs to reactive. He was known to have external um, signs of head injury, such as an occipital scalp laceration. And this was um, closed primarily in the ED department which is important in um, first point of care and um, for hemostasis. And uh, next slide, please. So he underwent um, a pan scan. So he had a CT of his brain, cervical spine, and CT of his thorax, abdomen, pelvis. These are three um, slices of the CT brain. Um, the first one to the left um, is to demonstrate that his basal cisterns were relatively open. And then the other slices um, to the right and demonstrates um, some very mild diffuse cerebral swelling. And then the one to the right shows um, some interhemispheric blood and some traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. And there's some evidence of um, subgale hematoma um, at, uh, on the right scan. Next slide, please. So with regards to the rest of his body, um, he had no spinal fractures. He had evidence of right basal consolidation, which was possibly um, due to aspiration. And um, importantly, he had no abdominal or, vi or visceral in injuries. 
Next slide, please. So this gentleman was uh, accepted for transfer uh, immediately. Um, we directed the re um, referring hospital to commence some basic ICP maneuvers. This involves elevation of the head of the bed to thir 30 to 45 degrees, particularly in the setting of no spinal fractures. This improves um, uh, 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 um, venous drainage, um, and we also asked um, for the CO2 to be maintained in the normal catholic ranges. Who's also commenced um, anti-epileptics. Other things that we would ask for is to maintain um, normal tension um, and uh, transfer immediately. Next slide, please. So when he arrived into Bournemouth Hospital, he underwent a repeat scan, which was stable. He was admitted into our intensive care unit for an ICP monitor. Um, ICP monitors, um, there are many different types. And um, he underwent um, a standard um, strain gauge um, carbon um, probe inserted in interparenchymally. Next slide, please. So there are two main trials um, that attempted to demonstrate the benefit of um, ICP management in the in, in traumatic um, brain injured patient. The best trip um, came out in 2012, um, and although it didn't show any statistical significant difference. Sorry, I've lost the slides there. So the best trip um, was a randomized control study that um, randomized patients into ICP or to clinical and radiological um, arms um, and although there was a slight trend to improvement in overall um, survival in the ICP um, group, this did not reach statistical significance. However, Ronan et al in a retrospective review did demonstrate quite conclusively that um, ICP monitored and ICP goal directed treatment did um, improve survival and morbidity. Next slide please. So over the next 72 hours, he um, went through um, tier one and tier two treatments. Um, he was kept maximally sedated um, and with normal capnic ranges and normal um, CPP targets. Um, but however, despite this, um, he had intermittent um, elevations of ICP. He would go up to 25 to 30 and sustain for minutes and return down to baseline. He had three boluses of hyperosmolar therapy um, and a repeat CT brain showed that everything um, remained stable. The probe was changed um, and this again returned back readings of um, high ICPs. He then underwent um, thiopentone and um, a barbiturate coma um, and muscle relaxation and um, muscle paralysis. Um, this tier of treatment is to reduce the, the basal metabolic um, rate of the brain to, to reduce um, cerebral perfusion. Um, next slide, please. Over over the next while, um, he actually under, had a sustained elevation in ICP um, and his pupil, pupils became fixed. It appeared that he was cycling through a vasodilatory cascade. Um, next slide, please. Just briefly about um, ICP waveforms. ICP waveforms are superimposed um, pulsations, pressure waves um, that are on the background of a cardiac cycle. So in, in the normal ICP, um, the P1 is a percussion wave, which represents the normal um, systemic blood pressure. P2 would be the tidal wave and, and reflects intracranial compliance. Um, intracranial compliance is an important factor in, in, in compensation of any mass lesion or swelling. Um, ICP waveform B demonstrates a non-compliant brain where P2 is higher than P1. Next slide, please. So because this gentleman um, went through a critical event, he, uh, he underwent an emergency bifrontal and um, decompressive hemicraniectomy. This really is about um, bypassing um, the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, which um, states that the brain intracranial contents are in a state of equilibrium, which is the brain parenchyma, CSF, um, and the arterial venous blood supply. Whenever a mass lesion is introduced, and um, there is a period of um, compensation through displacement of CSF um, and however any further increase 
and that mass leads to a decompensation and a exponentially elevated ICP. Next slide, please. So postoperatively, um, he had um, some intermittent ICP spikes that were controlled um, medically. He, we subsequently stopped um, sedation and he had a tracheostomy and was discharged from ICU um, GCS 40. And what we mean by this is that um, the verbal response was not accessible because he had a tracheostomy. He underwent um, inpatient um, rehabilitation um, and, and several weeks later he underwent autologous um, cranioplasty. He was referred to the NRH um, and it was transferred back in day 42. And a three-month review, he had a, a, a Glasgow outcome scale extended of um, severe disability. And at the eight-month review, he had actually made um, quite significant gains. He's now mobilizing. He can look after himself um, feeding-wise. He does need help with some daily activities, but he, he, he does seem to be improving. Next slide, please. So um, neurocritical care is just a bit more than ICP monitoring. Um, and at the moment, we're introducing multimodality um, monitoring in, in Beaumont Hospital. Next slide, please. So um, the brain tissue oxygenation um, we, is, is something that we, we've just commenced. Um, and this is based on the BOOST2 trial that showed that there was an improved Outcomes with regards to more morbidity and mortality um, when um, the partial pressure of um, brain tissue oxygenation is, is taken into account. Next slide, please. This has given rise to two other trials, the Bonanza trial in Australia and New Zealand and the BOOST 3 trial in, in, in the US, which will help uh, us understand the actual treatment thresholds um, for integrating ICP and, and brain tissue oxygenation. Next slide, please. Other forms of multimodality imaging um, include um, juggler bulb and um, venous oximetry and transcranial Doppler. Um, Non-invasive near-infrared spectroscopy is, a, is another modality and, and cerebral and microdialysis, and which is employed in, in academic centers. And that really measures the, the byproducts of um, cerebral metabolism. Next slide, please. And finally, the, the last and um, newest area of um, multimodality imaging is the Cerebral Pressure Reactivity Index, which really takes a look at cerebral autoregulation and its relationship to um, systemic um, um, blood supply. And this will allow um, personalized treatment um, and certain setting of um, personalized goal, goals in cerebral perfusion. Next slide, please. So in summary, the, the basic maneuvers um, on the scene and in the emergency department um, really does add into um, improved outcomes. Um, there's more to trauma than um, neurotrauma than um, just cloud evacuation. Um, and it's important that we understand the relationships between um, systemic blood pressure, cerebral perfusion and ICP, um, and particularly um, the waveforms relationships. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, that, that's a very nice um, uh, case presentation, which, which highlights um, highlights quite a few points. Uh, I'm just going to comment on a couple of those, and maybe you can come in on them. And then there's a couple of qu questions that have been coming in, which uh, which I might just ask you to comment on. Uh, the first thing is, I, I think the case describes very well, or shows really well, the patients were their ICP, their, their intracranial pressure or ICP is, is very high, but the brain doesn't look very swollen on the CT scan. Um, would, would you comment on that? I mean, the, the sort of patients that we see that in. Of course. So what we look for, we look for three aspects um, when we're making decisions. We look for the radiological aspect, the physiological aspect, which would be the ICP and, and the clinical which would be in the sedated patient and the pupil assessment. Um, and any radiological evidence of pressure really relies on um, brain compliance um, and the brain is just a viscoelastic material. And, and some, some brains do swell and shift um, and quite significantly where others um, will, will do marginally. Um, and 
the more tighter and stiffer brain, the, non, the non-compliant type of brain, only marginal changes um, radiologically can, can um, translate into significant changes in physiologically in ICP. Um, so that's why we went back um, and verified that the ICP monitor was working before making any final decisions. Yeah, and I think that kind of uh, makes the point that some years ago, the guidelines effectively said that if somebody has a head injury and has a GCS of eight or less and has to be intubated for airway control and and uh, reduction of the intracranial pressure, then they really, if they're going to be ventilated, uh, we moved away from the old uh, way of doing it where we left them kind of on ventilators without any intracranial pressure monitoring and and uh, uh, this case kind of demonstrates very well why you can't rely on the CT scan alone and the the intracranial pressure monitoring is what really dictated the um, uh, the management of the patient. Um, the other thing I just wanted to comment on is uh, just for people out there that, that are managing these patients at the very early uh, parts of the management, some of the uh, um, maneuvers that can be done, and you, you pointed them out, head elevation. I mean, um, perhaps we'll show some of our intraoperative videos at some of these webinars, because when we open the head, say, for um, after a hemorrhage or head injury or brain tumor or whatever it is and the, the intracranial pressure is very high we do a craniotomy the brain is swelling out of the out of the skull and we give a, a 30 for 30 degrees head elevation you see an immediate uh, relaxation of, of the brain in in these cases so head elevation is very important in these cases uh, manitol and uh, hypertonic saline as osmotic diuretics and then you talked also about hyperventilation uh, for short periods and just bringing the, the not allowing hypercapnia because the, the high PCO2 will, will cause vasodilation intracranially and then again uh, increase in, in the intracranial pressures. Um, before we move on to uh, Michael's presentation, um, somebody has asked here, uh, when should they contact a, a, a neurosurgeon? Would you, would you comment on that? Um, I mean, if there's any concern or uh, um, at all, I mean, they should pick up the phone and, and give us a call. Um, I mean, there's there's good there's guidelines out there, such as it really depends on, on the situation in the in the conscious patient or the unconscious patient. But certainly, if there's any concern, and um, they can always. Um, give us a call and uh, to discuss the case, even even in mild head injuries. Um. Yeah, I think that there are guidelines out there, and actually, I did uh, I did put them up when I gave the talk uh, about manager management of head injuries, and we might actually do a rerun of that and put up some of the the guidelines in terms of the, the indications for scanning and indications for neurosurgical. Uh, 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 you know, consultation and things like that. So it, it, it's actually quite a, a big topic in itself, I think, that question. Um, I don't see any other things we want to. Um, somebody here has said, how common is for fixed dilated pupils to revert to normal? Um, do you want to comment on that, Kieran? Again, we would need to be into, put into context of um, the, the primary injury um, and the speed at which um, intervention happens. So in this case, he became fixed and dilated um, and immediately postoperatively his pupils came down. So he, he was in our ICU and within, I think it was certainly within 40 minutes, he went from ICU into, into theatre. Um, so. It yeah. really depends on the situation, the age of the patient, the mechanisms of injury, yeah. and the degree of parenchymal injury and primary injury, and, and how things evolve over time. So, so yeah. somebody with severe head injury, head injury with fixed and dilated pupils on the scene with obvious brainstem injury, um, that that won't resolve. But something that evolves over and is um, due to a progressive supratentorial pressure, and that can be relieved. And that, that's, again, something different. Yeah, I think uh, that's where I think sometimes to the referrers, it seems odd that sometimes we take a patient, say, with a, with, with a fixed pupil and sometimes we don't. 
obviously unilaterally fixed dilated pupil is a, uh, lesser of a problem, particularly if we see something that's reversible on the scan. So we have to put all the information together. If somebody has an extradural hematoma with a unilat particularly unilaterally fixed dilated pupil, we would take that immediately and the clot evacuation can save their life and they can have a very good outcome. But if somebody has, say, bilateral fixed dilated pupils and they have uh, hemorrhage into the brainstem, on the scan, we know that's a, a, not a salvageable situation. Another uh, good question here is, should mannitol be given pr before transfer? Kieran. So we use, what's, what is recommended is that mannitol be reserved for clinical signs of herniation. So you, you, whenever one of the things that we will ask um, the referring teams to do is after they perform the simple maneuvers of head of the bed up, monitor the CO2, and maintain normal systemic um, and blood pressure is is to not to have the eyes taped to to um, do regular pupil assessment because in some some departments are several hours away um, and things can evolve quite rapidly. So any clinical sign of herniation, such as a, a, an involving blown pupil, should be given hyperosmolar therapy. Um, and sometimes we may direct just based on radiology if, if there's significant degree of shift and concerns with impending herniation and then we may ask may may ask for um, hyperosmolar therapy there as well. Yeah again so just to emphasize the assessment of the pupils on a regular basis if you have somebody who's ventilated and you're transferring them your only uh, way of assessing any deterioration is to look at the pupils so leave leave those uh, uh, you know on tape or regularly uh, view them and you know if there is any change and one pupil, say, becomes fixed dilated, definitely give mannitol. And always when you contact us, it's something we must not forget to tell you. And, and you can also ask us, should we give mannitol, particularly in somebody is uh, who is bad enough to be intubated? Often we would say, yes, go ahead and give the mannitol en route to Beaumont. Um, I'm just going to go one more question and then we move on to Michael's presentation. Should all major head injuries have decompressive craniectomy? Um, short answer is no, not all. Um, again, it depends on, on the scenario. So, um, taking the same scenario, should the pupils not have become fixed in this case, and then an EVD, and would have been a a reasonable alternative to help control ICP. And um, so, so again, it, it really depends on, on the scenario. So sometimes we can get away with the the thiopentone or the barbiturate induced coma and um, with the muscle paralysis that that's enough to reduce the basal metabolic rate in the brain to help reduce and um, the total demands um, and help improve and um, that Monroe Kelly doctrine and um, by reducing total intracranial blood and um, sometimes we can we, we that that is just sufficient in itself so it, it really depends and and also raising cranial pressure is multifactorial. There may be a surgical lesion such as a large contusion or a clot that has evolved over time, which requires a, a, different, a different approach than just a straightforward and decompression. Yeah, and I, I, I think what I, the only thing I'd add to that is that decompressive craniectomy in the setting of very diffuse injury uh, is often a very difficult decision to make because we know that we can save life, but sometimes uh, with a very, very poor um, uh, quality of life, very, very dependent uh, people are, are produced by this procedure. Um, but I suppose it is being more and more done, particularly in the younger group of patients. Uh, and it's something that needs to be assessed further, but it's it's a difficult decision to make sometimes. Uh, I'm going to move on for, for time reasons to, there are other questions, we might be able to come back to them at the end of the session, but I think we can move on with uh, Mr. Michael Amu's presentation and uh, I'll introduce Michael. Michael is one of our specialist registrars on the training program uh, in Beaumont. He's very active both clinically and in the research setting. He's published uh, something like 17 papers in the last year and he is, um, is, is he has a special interest in uh, in head injury and neurotrauma. Go ahead Michael. Uh, thanks Professor Jawapur. Um, my name is Michael. 
uh, and I'll be presenting a great case of a blunt cerebrovascular injury. Uh, the patient is a 31-year-old um, lady, uh, restrained driver, uh, a lone occupant uh, in a car. Um, the curbside wheels um, struck the curb at high speed, causing the car to overturn. Her GCS at the scene was 13. Um, she was losing 0.4 uh, verbal score. Uh, and following a prolonged extrication, uh, she was airlifted to uh, the nearest major hospital. Uh, her primary and secondary survey uh, as per the ATLI guidelines, um, she had uh, C-spine immobilization uh, due to the high impact injury, as well as complaint of uh, cervical spine uh, pain and tenderness. She didn't have any airway compromise. Uh, respiratory function uh, was within normal limits, and there wasn't any evidence of circulatory um, uh, shock with a negative focused abdominal ultrasound. Her GCS was 14 by the time she got to the hospital. Uh, now uh, just a bit confused. Um, her, her other uh, injuries uh, was a right knee laceration uh, as well as a, a, a quite a, a deep um, frontal laceration uh, on her scalp, uh, which explains the mechanism of injuries that you will see later. Uh, given the fact that her forehead was struck against the steering wheel, uh, causing her to have a, a hyperextension injury. Um, she also had some pain and swelling in her right foot. Uh, her Asia score, which is the uh, American Spinal Injury Association Impairments uh, Scale, uh, was E. Um, it is uh, essentially classification of spinal cord injury based on uh, motor and sensory neurological examination. Uh, e is a completely normal neurological examination where A is complete loss of motor and sensory function. Uh, she had a pan scan which included a CT brain uh, which shows that small frontal contusion as well as diffuse subarachnoid blood that we see here. Uh, pretty much the classic uh, textbook star, sa star shaped sign um, uh, of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, which is blood on the surface of the brain, is is common with trauma. Uh, it's very rare that we see this pattern of blood, uh, with blood going down all the way down into foramen magnum and uh, the anterior CSF space at the uh, craniocervical junction. Uh, th this pattern of blood was quite concerning. Uh, it raised the question of the chicken or the egg. Did she have a subarachnoid hemorrhage and crash her car? or did she crash her car and have a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Uh, CT of her cervical spine, uh, starting from the top here uh, at C1, she had uh, a fracture through the posterior arch uh, of C1 on the left side. Uh, uh, and also, as you can see here at C2, there's a fracture through the lateral mass. Uh, um, when we look at C2 uh, closely, uh, you can see the fracture extends bilaterally through the bilateral lateral mass processes with a uh, traumatic uh, spondylolisthesis um, of the body and a odontoid peg. Uh, this is the classic uh, hangman's fracture. Uh, she also had a fracture at C6 uh, with a fracture through the lamina and spinous process. Uh, this is a stable fracture. Uh, a fracture at T1, um, uh, anterior vertebral body with loss of height and no retropulsion. She had injury at T2 and at T3 as well. Given the mechanism of injury, uh, the anatomical location of the fractures um, uh, and the diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, we know that the vertebral artery uh, uh, runs around uh, where these fractures are. So the concerns was that um, she had uh, either dissected um, or uh, even um, transected her vertebral artery from a penetrating injury from a bone fragment. So following referral to us, we advised a CT angiogram, uh, which is shown here, the axial slices. Um, uh, overall, there isn't any major change in the caliber of the vertebral arteries bilaterally. Um, this is the left vertebral artery here and the right uh, vertebral artery in close proximity to the lateral mass fracture at C2. Uh, we, Michael, 
Yeah, just yes. to say, can you point that out if possible? Because most of us oh, don't okay. uh, really appreciate it. Uh, can, can you see my, my mouse icon? We can't see your mouse, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately, no, you're sharing the screen. OK, OK, okay. okay. but I, 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 I. Just give yeah, it one more yeah. try, Michael. No. OK, OK, I'll give it another go here. No. Sorry, Michael, you probably can't do it because you're um, it's. Oh, there's a there's a dot coming on the screen there. Oh, there. Uh, two seconds. There. Can we see the dot there? Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the right vertebral artery is this structure um, that I'm underlining with the, the red dot here. Um, this this is the lateral mass of of C2. Uh, which uh, a segment of the vertebral artery running with, within the transverse foramen. Um, now, it's difficult to kind of appreciate this in, in 2D. Uh, when the vertebral artery leaves the transverse foramen, it loops around C2 uh, and courses uh, kind of posterior medially to course, to course over the posterior arch of C1. So that's the loop we're seeing uh, here. Uh, and then the left side here, this, this is the loop uh, coming up above C1. Um, so following admission to Beaumont Hospital, she had an MRI um, to, uh, I suppose, assess for soft tissue injury as well as any spinal cord injury. Um, uh, although she did not have any clinical evidence of spinal cord injury, this is a stir signal, um, uh, sorry, a stir sequence, uh, which shows some hyper intensity uh, around the interspinal ligaments uh, at the upper cervical uh, vertebrae. Uh, as well as uh, hyperintensity within uh, the, the fractures that were described earlier um, here. Uh, there wasn't any evidence of spinal cord injury. So at this stage, we, we still um, could not um, explain the uh, cause of the diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage. So uh, she had a formal cerebral angiogram in the form of a digital subtraction angiography. Uh, what we're looking at here is a lateral uh, view of uh, contrast injection into the left vertebral artery. Um, uh, around here would be uh, uh, the C2, C3 junction. This would be uh, where C2 uh, would be and C1 would be around here. So this is the loop that courses over the posterior arch of C1. Uh, this is the end of uh, what is um, the V2 segment of the vertebral artery and the V3 segments before it enters the dura to become uh, the intracranial component of, of the vertebral artery. Uh, the, the striking abnormalities as highlighted here uh, is this vascular blush um, uh, around the area of the fracture, uh, which is highlighted by the uh, red arrow. Uh, some irregularities within the vertebral artery, which is concerning for a dissection that isn't flow limiting. Uh, and also the blue arrow shows um, uh, a vein filling. This is the arterial phase of the angiogram. Uh, the way angiography works is injection into the artery. Uh, there is an arterial phase, a capillary phase, and then a venous phase. So we really shouldn't be seeing veins in this phase. So this appearance um, suggests that there is arterial venous shunting, uh, although it was low flow. Uh, this was discussed at the neurovascular MDT meeting. Uh, and the consensus was that we should repeat an angiogram in about a week to make sure that this doesn't uh, evolve into a high flow uh, arterial venous fistula. Uh, given the um, uh, angiographic diagnosis of a dissection, uh, she was commenced on aspirin to reduce her risk of, develop, of developing a stroke. Uh, with regards to her spinal injuries, most of her injuries were stable. However, this um, hangman's fracture at C2 uh, is unstable uh, and the uh, recommendations, the guidelines would be for halo immobilization. Uh, we had a discussion with um, one of our spinal neurosurgeons, Mr. David O'Brien, uh, and he advised that since we were planning another angiogram, we, we delayed uh, the um, halo. So about a week later, she had uh, a repeat angiogram uh, 
Uh, this time, uh, uh, our neuroradiologist um, looked a bit more proximal uh, in the vertebral artery. So what we're looking at here is the vertebral artery um, uh, view from essentially C7 all the way up to where it um, becomes the vertebral, uh, the basilar artery, uh, uh, and that's split into the posterior cerebral arteries. So working from um, the bottom to the top, um, proximal to distal, uh, at C6, uh, we see this uh, area of uh, irregularity here. Uh, it's a narrowing of the blood vessel, uh, which uh, represents uh, a, an arterial dissection uh, without any limitations to the flow. Uh, we see the vascular blush around it, uh, which represents some extra visation. And we also see filling of, uh, of the venous plexus uh, the vertebral venous plexus around the vertebral artery. Uh, a similar appearance is seen uh, as we showed before uh, at C23 uh, and also uh, at the C1 level. Uh, these were still uh, low flow, um, so she was rediscussed at the neurovascular meeting, uh, and uh, the, the plan is that she will have a, a follow-up angiogram in the coming weeks to make sure that these don't evolve into high-grade fistula. Uh, she was continued on aspirin, uh, had an intensive inpatient rehabilitation, and thankfully was discharged home in a halo brace. Uh, she's been seen a couple of times uh, at Mr. O'Brien's clinic uh, with x-rays, uh, which shows um, a satisfactory alignment of the cervical vertebrae. Uh, she's going to be having a CT of her C-spine in a, in a couple of weeks uh, to see if she uh, has union of the C2 fracture. And at that stage, um, we'll be happy to remove the halo brace. So I'm just going to speak briefly about blunt cerebral vascular uh, injury. Um, when external force is applied to blood vessels, it could either be in the form of blunt trauma or penetrating trauma. Uh, blunt injuries predominantly uh, result in vessel dissection, whereas uh, penetrating injuries uh, usually uh, uh, cause laceration of, of the vessel. Uh, dissection results in vessel narrowing, uh, which uh, increases the risk of uh, ischemia due to um, uh, occlusion, thrombosis, or uh, embolus from the vessel. Uh, laceration results in formation of uh, uh, pseudoaneurysms, uh, fistula, uh, as well as uh, extravasation causing hemorrhage. Uh, they're usually associated with um, uh, a number of uh, injuries, uh, mainly severe head injuries, whereby um, there are basal skull fractures that course along um, basal uh, foramina where uh, important blood vessels uh, are passing through, uh, for example, the carotid canal uh, around the petrous temporal bone uh, and uh, the sphenoid sinus. Uh, the cervical spine fractures has, has been demonstrated in this case. Um, uh, of note, the uh, carotid arteries can also uh, be damaged by uh, C-spine fractures, especially in hyperextension, uh, rotation and hyperflexion injuries, whereby uh, the cervical segments can be impinged against the um, uh, lateral masses of, uh, of C1 to C3. Um, uh, you could also get injuries of uh, the external carotid artery and ICA uh, in uh, uh, maxillofacial injuries, um, uh, for example, in Lefort fractures and mandibular fractures. As you can see here, uh, the proximity of the mandible to, um, to the uh, carotid vessels. Uh, the incidence of uh, cerebrovascular injury in trauma is estimated to be around 1 to 3 percent. Um, there is a high risk of stroke and high risk of mortality associated with, with these. Uh, some of us might uh, remember the case of Phil Hughes, an unfortunate uh, Australian cricket player who, who was struck by a cricket ball at high speed and subsequently died uh, a couple of days later. Uh, he, he had had a, a vertebral artery injury, a dissection, and, and a massive intracranial hemorrhage. Um, following this, uh, there has been changes in the design of, of cricket helmets, uh, offering more protection uh, to the post-auricular and occipital area. Uh, the, the jury is still out uh, as to whether every trauma patient uh, should uh, have vascular imaging to rule out um, cerebrovascular uh, injury. Uh, studies haven't shown any cost effectiveness uh, so far. Uh, but there are um, some screening criteria. Uh, 
uh, uh, in summary, uh, the, the most widely used is the Denver criteria. Um, uh, any patient with high energy uh, a mechanism of injury uh, with basal skull fracture, uh, cervical spine fracture, uh, Lefort fracture, or, or even expanding cervical hematoma, uh, uh, epistaxis, uh, or any neurological deficit that's that's inconsistent uh, with with the um, head CT should have uh, uh, cerebrovascular imaging in the form of a CTA. Uh, the Denver grading system for cerebrovascular um, uh, injuries uh, is a five-grade system, with grade one being um, a, a an intimal tear uh, causing a dissection uh, with less than 25% um, uh, uh, um, uh, stenosis of the um, lumen of the vessel. If it's greater than 25%, it's grade two. If there's a pseudoaneurysm, it's grade three. It was complete occlusion of the vessel, it's grade four, and grade five is complete laceration. Um, traumatic arteriovenous fistula, although they are rare, um, uh, can either be grade three or grade four, uh, depending on uh, its effect on um, uh, cardiovascular output. Uh, so hemodynamically significant grade five fistulas would be uh, uh, fistulas that results in high output cardiac failure. Um, intuitively, uh, the risk of stroke um, with carotid artery uh, injury uh, uh, increases uh, with the grade. Um, the vertebral artery injury uh, doesn't seem to, to be related to the grading system, uh, and that's um, uh, mainly because of the uh, anatomy of the vertebral basilar system. Uh, the vertebral artery, there are two vertebral arteries that um, uh, end up as one. Uh, so usually a loss of one, uh, uh, if there is a good contralateral vertebral artery, it can compensate for it. Uh, the treatment options uh, for the ones that have the risk of forming uh, thrombus uh, and embolus, uh, the treatment option is uh, antithrombotic agents. Um, there are no RCTs uh, to demonstrate any superiority of uh, heparin antiplatelets uh, or anticoagulants. Um, uh, there is always concerns as to uh, anticoagulating patients who've already had hemorrhagic brain injuries, uh, but these two studies by uh, Shahan and McNutt, um, uh, although they were retrospective uh, cohort studies, uh, demonstrated no worsening of brain injury uh, in, uh, in pa patients, over 300 patients uh, who had uh, cerebrovascular injury. Uh, in grade four injuries where the vesicle, vessel is completely completely occluded. Um, there is a, a concern that sometimes even a minimal recanalization can increase the risk of stroke. So completely occluding the vessel could be an option. Um, uh, I suppose iatrogenic occlusion uh, in the form of um, parent vessel occlusion. Uh, grade threes, which are su um, pseudoaneurysms uh, as well as transsections, um, because of the risk of hemorrhage, uh, an option for pseudoaneurysm is embolization with coiling. Uh, with um, uh, flow divertent stents or even completely taking the vessel, provided that there's good collateral from, from the contralateral side. Uh, Antithrombotic agents can also be useful uh, in this case. Um, in summary, um, the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is trauma. Um, however, this is usually cortical uh, with uh, injury to peel vessels. Uh, so in for, for a case like this where uh, there's evidence to diffuse uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage um, or, or any hemorrhage within any of the basal cistern, uh, we should have a, a, a high suspicion for uh, cerebrovascular injury and there should be a low um, suspicion for uh, vascular imaging in patients with high impact trauma, upper cervical fractures and neurological deficits that are not explained by CT. Uh, thank you very much. Michael, that's an excellent presentation. Uh, thank you for putting that together. Um, it, it really highlights um, some of the points in terms of cerebrovascular injury, and, and you mentioned some of them. I just want to emphasize some of them. I think at the beginning you said, you know, with that pattern of hemorrhage, one of the problems we often run into is did the patient have an aneurysm or an AVM in the brain that has bled, that has led to the road traffic accident? 
in the first instance. That's uh, that's not as uncommon as as you might think. Often at our MDTs in the um, neurovascular MDT, we have to put scans of trauma patients up to see actually, you know, was it was there a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage caused by an aneurysm. Uh, the other important point is to have a, a high index of sus suspicion for vascular dissection. It's often missed. And you mentioned fistulas as well. And I have to mention our interventional neuroradiologists here who play a very, very big part in this. The management of these lesions has really become endovascular. Uh, there are a couple of questions before we, we tidy up. Uh, and one, Michael, you might want to comment on is, um, uh, is asked, um, where do we think the subarachnoid hemorrhage arose in the case that you presented? Um, you know, is it related to the um, impact of the trauma or do you think it's related to any of the dissections? Were any of them near enough to the intracranial component of the uh, vertebral artery? Um, so in, in this case, we, we felt that um, they weren't related to the vertebral artery injuries. The, um, uh, the, there are four segments of the vertebral artery and uh, the vertebral artery pierces dura uh, at frame and magnum to become intracranial. So those injuries are in the extracranial um, components of the vertebral artery, although there have been um, publications uh, showing um, uh, a subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, from uh, arterial venous fistulas, but they, they are usually high flow arterial venous fistulas uh, that could potentially bleed into the subarachnoid space that could travel upwards to give that pattern, uh, but they're very rare. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think in some cases it's difficult to know. And the important thing, I suppose, for us in this case is that we're going to follow her, uh, the patient up with repeat angiography, because sometimes you get delayed pseudoaneurysm formation in these cases that you mentioned. Uh, there's one uh, question that that has been asked, and I really want to. Uh, it's, a, it's a it's a very relevant and very um, important basic question, but we need to make sure everybody is aware of it. How common is hypotension and tachycardia in head injury? I would say if you ever have a patient after trauma who is hypotensive and tachycardic, look for bleeding outside the head. Do not blame it on the head injury. The head injury will give you hypertension and bradycardia. So that that's just something that's very important in, in any any. The other comment I just want to make is uh, it, when, when you are calling Michael uh, on a Friday when he's on his 24th phone call referral, just do bear in mind that those two, those 24 phone calls will each generate another three phone calls that he has to make back to the referring hospitals. So it is, so just be patient with our, our registrar in that sense. Um, I, I I think we, uh, unless somebody else, uh, Professor O'Connell or Professor Viani have comments or have seen a question that I've missed, I think we, we are good to close. Uh, no motion, I think you've, you've covered it. And I have to say, this is an exemplar of what we really need. Um, those of us who are outside of neurosurgical centers and not not in touch with uh, the sophisticated uh, uh, treatments that you have and also your algorithmic thinking and how you go about dealing with with head injuries in the context of multiple trauma uh, it's very valuable to us to uh, to to really uh, to have access to that i i have to say both cases are hugely informative and i'm uh, uh, we're all very uh, pleased that uh, the patients came through and I'm particularly uh, astonished at how well the second case did uh, given uh, the complexity of the fractures uh, and that uh, no actual surgical intervention was required to stabilize things other than a halo splint so so that's that's wonderful I, I think your suggestion of a regular um, uh, webinar um, in neurosurgery perhaps once a month uh, will be Excellent. I just see something coming in from Coleman Gilligan saying that we we need to make sure it doesn't clash with the National Trauma Forum at 8.30s on Wednesdays. But it may be an opportunity on a monthly basis to interact with that forum and maybe start uh, 30 minutes earlier uh, with the neurosurgical input. So that might be a, a fruitful exercise. So I leave that to you and your colleagues uh, to work out. Um, 
Can I thank you, uh, Motion, for your suggestion to have this and for organising it. Thank Kieran and Michael for two outstanding presentations. As always, thank you to the Vice President, Laura Vianney, uh, to Catherine Jordan, uh, to Porik and colleagues in the college who've put together this series. And I wish you good evening and congratulate you for stopping exactly at seven o'clock. Well done. <laughs> I follow orders. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.